of the Trust for American Health Organization, and Mr. Micah Ninberg is the Executive Director of the Hepatitis Education Project in Seattle, Washington. And um, this one to get me, Mr. Rolf Benersky, uh is a retired NFL. Oh, right, and now I got it because I remember that from his, uh, his football days. Now I got it right. Uh, spokesman for the Hepatitis um, Awareness, uh, Hepatitis C Awareness. And consistent with the committee policy, um, we'd like to ask you to please stand and let me swear you in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, please answer in the affirmative. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, uh, Okay, let's begin with Mr. Meyer and then come right down the line. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Randy Mayer. I am Chief of the Bureau of HIV, STD, and Hepatitis at the Iowa Department of Public Health. I also served as a member of the Institute of Medicine's Committee on the Prevention and Control of Viral Hepatitis Infections. The Institute of Medicine, or the IOM, is the health arm of the National Academy of Sciences, an independent, nonprofit organization that provides unbiased and authoritative advice to decision makers and to the public. The IOM was asked by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable to review current prevention and control strategies for viral hepatitis and to identify priorities for research policy and action. The IOM assembled an expert committee, of which I was a member, to address this task. The committee met five times over a 12-month period to gather evidence, deliberate on its findings and recommendations, and write the report. The report was released in January of this year, and more detailed information is included in my longer written statement. You've heard much of what the, the report uh, discussed earlier today from our other speakers, but the committee learned that in the next 10 years, about 150,000 people in the United States are expected to die from liver cancer and liver disease associated with chronic viral hepatitis. This condition is three to five times more frequent than HIV in the United States. Between 3.5 and 5.3 million people, or one to two percent of the population of the U.S., are living with hepatitis B or C. Those numbers are unacceptably high, considering that hepatitis B and C are both preventable and treatable. Unfortunately, about 65% of people with hepatitis B and 75% of people with hepatitis C do not realize that they have the disease. By comparison, about 21% of people who are HIV infected do not realize that they have HIV. This means that the majority of those with viral hepatitis are not seeking treatment or taking steps to prevent transmission of the disease to others. Hepatitis B and C are transmitted by sexual contact and by exposure to infected blood through the use of contaminated needles or other drug equipment and implements. In addition, about a approximately 1,000 infants per year are infected with hepatitis B during birth and people may have acquired hepatitis C through blood transfusions and transplants that occurred before 1992. After reviewing a great deal of evidence, the committee identified several underlying factors that impede cur current efforts to prevent and control hepatitis B and C. The primary factor is the lack of awareness about viral hepatitis among the general population and among healthcare and social service providers. This lack of awareness translates into a lack of public resources that are allocated for hepatitis B and C. States receive on average only $90,000 annually in federal funds for hepatitis prevention among adults. Because chronic viral hepatitis has not been a public health priority in the United States, at-risk people do not know they are at risk, and therefore they do not take steps to prevent infection or to get tested for the infection. Many health care providers, especially primary care providers, are also are not familiar with risk factors for hepatitis B and C. Therefore, they do not screen patients for risk factors to determine if they should be tested. In addition, many health care providers don't know how to manage chronically infected patients. The committee believes that to address this national epidemic, additional federal resources and guidance are necessary in four specific areas. 
disease surveillance, provider and community education, hepatitis B immunization coverage, and viral hepatitis services. Action is needed at the federal, state, and local levels to address the problem. In fact, 17 of the committee's 22 recommendations are aimed at federal and state agencies, including the CDC and the Health Resources and Services Administration. In conclusion, the committee believes that increased funding and a coordinated national effort would lead to reductions in new cases of hepatitis B and C, in medical complications and deaths associated with these diseases, and in total health costs. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Um, Mr. Ninberg. Thank you, Chairman Towns, committee members. Put your mic, turn your mic on. Thank you, Chairman Towns, committee members, for inviting me to testify here today. My name is Michael Ninberg, and I am the executive director of the Hepatitis Education Project, a nonprofit organization based in Seattle, Washington. I also serve on the steering committee of the National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable, a coalition of nonprofit organizations, uh, public health districts, and industry partners representing groups around the country. Until very recently, I was also a hepatitis patient. As we've heard uh, several times this morning, there are over 5 million Americans currently living with hepatitis B or hepatitis C, the overwhelming majority of whom are unaware of their infection. Being unaware, they can unwittingly transmit the viruses to others and often do things to speed up their own disease progression. Twelve years ago on this very same committee, Surgeons General Satcher and C. Everett Koop spoke of hepatitis C as a serious public health threat. You were here, Chairman Towns. Hepatitis B is also a grave public health threat. We still have an opportunity to address these issues, but that window of opportunity is closing. For those who are diagnosed early for hepatitis B and C, the prognosis is usually very good. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C are both treatable conditions, and hepatitis C is often curable. For people to be treated, however, they have to be diagnosed. This remains one of our greatest challenges. I was one of the fortunate who was diagnosed. I am also fortunate that I have access to excellent medical health care. In January of 2009, I entered a clinical trial looking at promising experimental new drugs for hepatitis C. The virus rapidly became undetectable on my system, and I completed treatment in December of last year. Just a few weeks ago, I received my final lab results and was told that I am cured. I happily use the past tense now when I say that I was a hepatitis patient. Sadly, still many Americans are unable to say that. My story is the one I know best, but it is not the one that is most important to me. That would be the story of my wife and my boy, Sasha. I met my wife, Lily, in graduate school, and shortly after we met, I told her that I had hepatitis C and explained to her what that meant and how it was transmitted. Later, I explained that there was another epidemic that was silent and largely unknown to the general public, and that was hepatitis B. I knew that among the groups at greatest risk were those born in countries where hepatitis B is endemic. One of those countries is China. That was where my wife Lily was born. I asked her if she had ever been tested for hepatitis C, and she said that she didn't know. I suggested that it would be a good idea for her to get tested. Eventually, she did, and she learned that she had chronic hepatitis B. Inactive, she was told, but as she got older, she would need to be screened for liver cancer to make sure that if she did develop liver cancer, it was caught early. If caught early, it is very treatable. Because she was tested, her prognosis is very good. I would like to end my statement today on a, a note of optimism. There are gaping holes uh, in this country's response to viral hepatitis. That's why we're here. There are, however, examples of successful life-saving initiatives that we can look to for inspiration. Since the early 90s, there has been a recommendation in the U.S. that all pregnant women get tested for hepatitis B, and all babies born to hepatitis B-positive women be given a series of protective vaccinations 
within the first 12 hours of birth. A pregnant woman will transmit hepatitis B to her newborn 90% of the time. However, if that newborn gets this series of shots, he or she will almost always develop immunity and not go on to develop chronic infection. As a result of this initiative, we have seen new hepatitis B infections in the U.S. plummet since the early 90s. Also as a result of this initiative, my little boy was given a life-saving series of vaccinations that spared him the potential fate of dying from liver cancer. Ultimately, that's what this is about. It's about a little boy who gets to grow up with both parents. It's about a mother and father who don't have to worry that they might outlive their children. It's about brothers and sisters and cousins and friends who don't have to bury a loved one after watching that person die a long, horrible death from end-stage liver disease or liver cancer. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Levy? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Jeff Levy. I'm Executive Director of Trust for America's Health. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization. As you've heard this morning, hepatitis is in a sense a ticking time bomb. Over 5 million people in the United States are infected with hepatitis B or C, yet an estimated 65 to 75 percent are not aware of their status, putting them at risk for developing chronic hepatitis, liver cancer, cirrhosis, or late-stage liver disease. With promising new treatments on the horizon that could dramatically improve our chances for effectively treating these individuals, we have a moral obligation to make sure that all who can benefit know their status and have access to care and the, the end result that Mr. Nunberg had. However, this is more than a moral argument. It is also a practical financial issue for our reforming health care system. The direct annual medical costs associated with HBV and HCV have been estimated at $7.6 billion. If we continue down the present course of late identification of people with viral hepatitis and therefore advanced disease upon entering treatment, the cost to the health care system will continue to grow. Indeed, one study has estimated that annual medical costs for hepatitis C alone could increase to $85 billion a year in 20 years, with Medicare taking on 39 percent of those costs. If we undertake aggressive actions, such as those I'm about to outline, we could dramatically change that equation for the better. The United States needs a comprehensive policy response to this problem. And I'm hopeful that the panel chaired by Dr. Koh when they release their report in October will include at least some of these elements. First, we need much better situa situational awareness and surveillance. We do not have sufficient data regarding the scope of the problem and who is affected. This affects not only our ability to prevent and treat disease, but it also creates a vicious cy cycle of inadequate evidence to support greater public resources to address the problem. <coughs> Second, we need to routinize screening for hepatitis B and C so hepatitis positive individuals learn their status and are linked to appropriate care. For H HBV, providers and patients need to have better awareness of who's at risk and assure they get screened, including all pregnant women. For hepatitis C, it is time to move to include nation of birth and age, not just behavioral factors, as we heard earlier this morning. Those should not be, it should not strictly be behavioral factors as the basis for screening, as many adults are unaware that the behaviors of their youth have put them in danger of infection. Third, we must assure that reform, the reformed health care system provides quality prevention and care for hepatitis, from screening and preventive services mandated for all plans, to HHS putting in place the appropriate policies that guarantee quality care for people with hepatitis. With health reform and near universal coverage, it really means that people will have the opportunity to take advantage of these new treatments. Fourth, we must assure that people stay in care with appropriate support services that will assure adherence to treatment. These services are especially important for marginalized populations such as immigrants, incarcerated individuals, or injection drug users. Although many of the adherence issues are similar, our health care system has been much more effective at assuring adherence for HIV than for hepatitis C. This is in part due to the additional services supported by the Ryan White program. Just as with HIV, there is a strong public health rationale for assuring successful completion of hepatitis treatment with these kinds of support services. Fifth, as we focus on assuring treatment, we must also remember that there are major opportunities for primary prevention of hepatitis. We continue to see pockets of outbreaks of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. We must close the gaps in hepatitis B vaccination coverage and use all educational and structural tools at our disposal to prevent transmission of hepatitis C. 
This includes federal funding of syringe exchange programs. While we're delighted that Congress has lifted the ban on states and localities opting to use exchange programs as part of their fight against hepatitis and HIV, we are disturbed by the delay in HHS issuing guidance to implement this change in policy. Sixth, within the area of primary prevention, we have within our reach the capacity to virtually eliminate mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B. 1,000 newborns in the United States become needlessly infected with hepatitis B each year. HRSA, CMS, and CDC must all work to incentivize routine HIV, HBV screening of all pregnant women and assure appropriate interventions with newborns. Finally, there needs to be an increased emphasis on research. In addition to research for better treatments, we desperately need to understand the reason for the disparate response to HCV treatments. African Americans have the highest rates of hepatitis C in the United States, more than twice that of whites, yet treatment is nearly half as effective in African Americans as compared to the general population. We need to require that clinical trial cohorts are diverse enough to assure that we know the safety and efficacy of new treatments for all who are affected by hepatitis. We are at a critical juncture in our nation's fight against hepatitis. New treatments offer a great promise. A reforming health care system will improve coverage and access, and in the case of hepatitis Dr. B, we Levy, have a vaccine you, that can Dr. effectively Levy, could you eliminate summarize? it. The question remains whether as a nation we will seize this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Mr. Chairman, my name is Rolf Panerska, committee. Thank you so much for having us out here. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm a little tired. I, I look tired. I apologize for that. I, I took the red eye out this morning from San Diego, arrived, shaved in the uh, airport, changed clothes, and am thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled because of what you're doing. Uh, in a former life, I was a kicker. For 10 years, I was a kicker for the San Diego Chargers, played uh, under Don Coriel, the Dan Fouts years. And as a kicker, my job was usually to come in at the end of the game and sort of uh, try to kick it through the uprights. Uh, today, we've heard three panels of incredibly distinguished, uh, knowledgeable people share with you all of the issues. They're, they're out on the table. We know them. My job today is to share with you from a patient's perspective how this virus actually uh, occurs. Uh, by way of background, I'm an immigrant son. My dad came over, uh, learned the language, uh, ended up uh, going to Harvard, ended up teaching at Harvard, uh, became a world-renowned pathologist. Uh, left Harvard to go to Dartmouth and moved our family to San Diego where he teaches uh, at the medical school at UCSD. I've been around academic medicine my entire life, but I'm the black sheep of the family. My brother, older brother is an orthopedic surgeon and I was drafted into the NFL. My dad wondered where he went wrong. <laughs> Things changed though. In my second season with the Chargers, I came down with an illness, originally diagnosed as having Crohn's disease. It was later mended to ulcerative colitis, but it would require four major abdominal surgeries, two within six, week, uh, six days of each other. And my weight dropped from 187 pounds to 120 pounds, and I wasn't supposed to live. I needed 80 units of blood to survive. Uh, that same blood, I would find out 12 years later, that saved my life, put my life in jeopardy. I was able to return to the game, played seven more seasons. Uh, wore an ileostomy bag for four of those years and became very involved in raising awareness for people with inflammatory bowel disease and those facing ostomy surgery. I learned that one person can make a difference. Fast forward my life to uh, getting married and, and having children. Twelve years ago, uh, after adopting two children and having one, we had our fourth and I went in for a routine life insurance exam and was told by one carrier that I had a preferred rating, but the other carrier called me and said, your liver enzymes are slightly elevated. We'd like you to get retested. Feeling good, uh, in good shape, continuing to work out. I was not worried in the least, went and got re-examined, was brought into the physician's office, and like a two by four to my head, I was told that I was infected with the hepatitis C virus. At that moment, uh, I was scared to death. Uh, my previous illness just involved me and my silly career. This illness now affected a wife and four kids who were depending on me and it became real. I was, uh, felt like I was handed a death sentence, didn't know anything about the virus, felt unclean. How did I get it? I decided to uh, take my family on a six-week trip. We rented a motorhome and drove around the 
the west uh, in the United States, Grand Canyon, visited a bunch of uh, scenic places, built some memories, scared that this might be the last time I have with my family. But at the end of that trip, came back and with my wife, made a commitment to understand as much as I could about this virus and fight it. Fortunately, uh, I was uh, uh, under good medical care, found a hepatologist who was as passionate about fighting this disease as I was about getting uh, rid of it. And I started on a clinical trial. That was uh, 12 years ago. That clinical trial uh, cleared the virus while I was on the treatment. But a month after going off the treatment, the virus came back. That trial involved a daily injection of interferon uh, coupled with an antiviral pill. After getting the news that I uh, had had the virus come back, my physician sat with me and said, there's another molecule out there, a different interferon molecule. If you're willing, I think you should go on treatment. So three months later, I went on a second course of treatment, daily injection, maximum dose, antiviral pill, and went through all of the side effects for another year, cleared the virus while I was on the treatment, and then a month after going off, the virus came back. Now twice defeated, but buoyed by the knowledge that my reason for going on treatment was still there, a wife and four children, I waited. Now fortunately, uh, there are other people that have joined our fight, like the government is joining our fight now. There are pharmaceutical companies out there that are advancing research. And four years later, there was a new treatment, a pegylated interferon, one that required a weekly injection instead of a daily injection better understanding of, of how the virus is fought. I went on that treatment. It was a year-long treatment, coupled with an antiviral. The, the one-month post-test came back clear. The three-month post-test came back clear. Mr. Bernerke, I'm going to have to ask you to summarize. And the problem is, if I don't, I'll have to ask you to wait an hour and 45 minutes before we come back. I don't want to do that, sir. Okay, I will summarize. So <laughs> I figured that would encourage you. The, uh, <laughs> The six-month treatment came back virus-free, which means I'm free of the virus. I'm cured. I'm, I'm here to thank you for what you're doing. I'm here to support all of the things that have been spoken about the need to raise awareness, not just raise awareness, uh, to, to get screened, raise awareness, and then to do something about it. We have, as Congressman Bill Bray suggested, a great opportunity to make a difference. There are treatments out there, and I just I want to thank you again on behalf of all of us for what you're doing. I want to thank all of you for your uh, testimony, and let me say to the members, um, uh, we have a business meeting, and if we could start right now, we could actually do it, and we be, would be over, and then go and vote. That way we won't have to come back an hour and 45 minutes or two hours. So you, if that's okay, we'll move forward. Let me thank you again for your testimony, and of course, we will um, probably ask questions for the record but we were going to have to uh, break it this time because of our voting schedule. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meyer. Thank you, Dr. Uh, to Mr. Ninberg and Dr. Levy. And, and Ms. Chairman, yes. may I make one comment? Because the next bill yeah. is mine. Yeah. <laughs> but I just want to say that the major research on interferon has been done down at the medical school and hospital in Cuba. And that is what is sustaining the life of Fidel Castro, who had stomach cancer right. and was expected to die. So had he been able to come to the international uh, research uh, forums and been invited, we would have had interferon in use in clinical trials and other places in our country. So thank you so much. Right. Thank you, lady, uh, gentle lady from California. So we're going to... This, this uh, panel is actually dismissed. Thank you so much for your coming and your testimony. And we do not want to hold you an hour and 45 minutes, so we want to, going to let you go now. Okay? Thank so you, you. you. You can be excused. The, 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 the hearing is now adjourned.
ready. Excuse me, we're ready. Will come to order. <laughs> Today, we are considering a number of commemorative resolutions and postal naming bills. I ask unanimous consent that these measures be considered in block and as read and open to amendment at any point. The clerk will designate the bills. HRES 546, recognizing the historical significance of Juneteenth Independence Day.